Yeah. Like I initially hearing that, I can't tell if that's someone trying to make themselves feel better or just vicious. Yeah, I think it's unlikely. Or somebody fishing. Yeah. Right. See what see what the family knows. What the police know. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Right. That's that's what he was doing. Right. What do the police know? Right. And 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 it's like what you, Mike said, or it's cruel, or you call and you're giving little tidbits and you're teasing that that poor mother, you know, and the sister and the granddaughter. I mean, right. uh, the niece, like, uh, you know, to do that to the family, that's a coward. Yeah. To me, you know, I just can tell, I'm still passionate about this yeah, case. Right. Well, I remember it like it was yesterday. Can I ask you? Like I can see it. Uh, why is this case so important to you? to the Detective Story Podcast. I'm Mike Hammond. Thanks again for joining in. really appreciate it. As you can see, we've got some new digs here today. We're recording at the Flava Pod Podcast Studio on the northwest side. Um, thank you to Carlos and Jay for having us in here. We really appreciate it. Uh, you can visit them at flavapodcast.com. It's F-L-A-V-A podcast.com. I appreciate it. also got two great guests with me, my brother-in-law, Chris Krafka, so you'll remember from episodes 11 and 12. And my good friend Bobby Rodriguez, uh, former Chicago police officer, Chicago homicide detective for 17 years, one of the guys that really taught me how to do the job, and he's not going to be happy from, about me saying it, but uh, a real legend on the Chicago Police Department homicide unit. He's, everybody knew Bobby, had great respect for him. He taught me a lot, him and his partner, Carlos Velez. Um, so excited to have you here. Thanks so much for joining, Bobby. Thank you. Glad to be here. And Chris. As always, man, I appreciate it. Uh, we'll let Chris take us away, man. We're episode 14. Go ahead. So the, this is a case of Elizabeth Veloz, a female Latina, 27 years old at the time that she went missing. She lived on the uh, east side of Chicago. East Correct. side, right? Correct. Uh, not to be confused with Hegewish. Correct. East side. Uh, at the time she was last seen, she was wearing a blue sweater, a Georgetown t-shirt, black jeans, white shoes and carrying a coach purse. It was July 26, 1992. She was last seen leaving Jocko's Bar located at 95th Street and Avenue M, the Chicago Southeast Side with three men, Anthony Rivera and brothers Richard Acevedo and Victor Acevedo. At some point, as I understand it, uh, an argument or altercation happened in the car. Uh, and at some point, she was either kicked out of the car or she left the car willingly uh, and that was the last anybody ever saw of her. And as I understand it, her body has not been recovered. Is this, I have to ask, uh, then a homicide investigation or is this a murder? I mean, a missing persons investigation. Uh, initially, it was uh, classified as a missing persons investigation by the Chicago Police Department. And uh, over several months, probably two years, uh, no one ever heard from Elizabeth and or had any contact with her. And uh, it, it was assigned to uh, uh, a homicide team to do a follow-up on, on her, trying to locate her. How, how did you come to, to catch the case, as they say? Well, I was a homicide detective assigned to the cold case unit the Chicago Police Department. And one day I received a phone call from a uh, FBI agent asking if he could meet with me. And I agreed to meet with him. And he showed up at our office and he had a file with him. And he showed me the file about uh, Elizabeth being missing for several years. And 
and he asked if I would uh, help him follow up on the investigation. And I'm sure, why not? You know, it, it intrigued me. Right. Uh, the area, I was very familiar with the area where she lived and where she was last seen. Is that where you grew up, that area, or? Uh, well, yeah, yeah, I, when I was very young, I grew up in that area. Okay. Uh, right down the block, there's a big park, and I used to hang out in the park all the time when we were kids. Go down to the beach and, and uh, play baseball. Right. Go down and uh, uh, swim down at the beach, stuff like that. And, uh, but the interesting part about it is that the FBI agent that came to me and asked me to help him, I asked him, why are you investigating this case? There's not too many FBI agents uh, do follow up on cold case homicides right. back, back in the early 2000s when right. I first started looking at it. And the interesting was, and it was really sad, was that the agent said, told me that he had a family member that disappeared, a female family member, and was never located. And he thought that when he saw a picture of Elizabeth, the picture reminded him of his family member. And Whoa. he had a, how do you want to describe it? But he- He had like an emotional connection. He had, yeah, yeah, I guess you could say that. You know, that's one way of how to describe it. Right. And he decided he wanted to follow up on Elizabeth's case. And he wanted to uh, try to find her. And this is in like 1990, this is in like 2002? I believe so, around there. Yeah, so uh, like almost 10 years after she had gone missing. Correct. Man, I, there, in all the cases that you you go over in your podcast, I, the one fundamental important part is the victim. And in this case, man, she was missing for 10 years at this point. That family must have just been going through hell. Correct. You, did you develop a relationship with the family? Yes, I did. Uh, through the agent, because the agent had already made contact with the family, and he was um, he was interviewing them. He was trying to, you know, start at, start at the beginning. You know, right. When you're in a cold case, you start in the beginning. You always start at the beginning. Go and back you, to s yeah, square, square one. Square one. It's like a new murder. Right. Like, a, like you're going out on the scene of a fresh murder. You go out start your investigation from the ground floor, and hopefully you take it all the way to somebody gets convicted and goes to the penitentiary. And, and uh, so he had, he had developed that relationship and eventually he brought me into that relationship. Right. Uh, we we're working together, we we're out doing interviews, uh, uh, trying to develop new leads, credible leads, where we can try to locate her body. Our goal was to locate Elizabeth. Right. That that was our goal. Myself, uh, my former partner, and the agent. Like we need to find her. That's the main thing. To this day, that's my goal. I want to find her, and I can explain that later. If, if right. I'd like to take a moment from the program to have a real talk about safety and security. Toward that end, I would like to introduce you to my friends over at Blue Knight Security Solutions, your ultimate partner in protection. Blue Knight Security Solutions isn't just your average check your ID at the door security company. They're a team of elite detectives, investigators, and law enforcement professionals with unparalleled expertise. Whether you need their real world investigative prowess or securing your home, business, synagogue, church, Church or event, Blue Knight has you covered. From risk assessment to tailored security plans, they'll ensure your safety. Blue Knight Security Solutions provides street smart operators who can handle any situation. Contact Blue Knight Security Solutions today at 773-706-4920 or visit Blue Knight Security Solutions.com. Blue Knight Security Solutions.com. Just backtrack a little bit. What years, I'm just trying to get a reference point. I was in cold case, I think 2005 to 2007 range, mm -hmm. and you were there that whole time. What time had you gotten there? Do you remember what year you went to cold case? Yeah. <laughs> I don't remember the exact year. But it was soon after. I made Detective 2000, so it was soon after that because you weren't in Area 4. Correct, yeah. I had spent as yeah, much time I don't, I don't remember the exact year I got. I was assigned there. No worries, but you hadn't been there very long when you picked this up, right? Yeah, did they, uh, yeah. Had maybe about a year or two. You know, when he came and asked if we can help him try to find, right. you know, yeah. uh, locator. And, and 
I, I eventually learned that the FBI had did a lot of work on the case, along with Chicago Police Department, trying to locate her. Earlier, earlier in the in the yeah, case, in, in, in the a, infancy of the investigation, right. they tried to find her. How, how did that become? How did the FBI come to be involved? Is uh, if I remember correctly, uh, somebody contacted the victim's family. Uh, they they called the victim's family and told the victim, "Hey, she was in Indiana with us. You know, we took her to the harbor, the, the area where she got uh, last seen. They call it the harbor." Based upon what I knew about the harbor, I'm like, back in the 90s, pretty rough neighborhood. You know, a lot of uh, public housing in the area. Um, it's not a nice area to be dropped off at at 3 in the morning, 4 in the morning. Oh, especially for a female, huh? Correct. Yeah. Correct. After coming out of a bar. Correct. And so if they dropped her off in Indiana, that would have been... Yeah, like, so that would have given, given the FBI jurisdiction to look correct. at it. They don't really... As, as a matter of course, the G doesn't really investigate murders uh, as such. Now, they have, like, task force where I have Chicago detect. You actually worked on the task force. I did. Up, right? So in those cases, they will work on active homicides or as part of bigger conspiracy investigations, they will. Um, and, like, on the uh, Native American reservations, right. they have jurisdiction on murders. But this because of the Mann Act, I think is still probably uh, relative to this, right? Because it crossed state lines, Correct. then they have jurisdiction. So this could have been that agent just picked that up right. because he got interest or got a call from the family maybe, you know? And, and, and the FBI kind of, they, they, they were nosing around on that investigation maybe after about a year. And that was because uh, uh, Elizabeth's mother uh, contacted them and was asking for help. She was able to figure out, hey, they went across state lines. Right, so, so crossing state lines brings exactly. the feds in. And yeah, yeah gotcha. just as Mike said, you, right. know, you, go, you cross state lines, that's a whole nother ball game, and that's when usually the feds get involved. Right. And uh, they, they uh, yeah, so that's how I met uh, Elizabeth's mother. And uh, uh, and what was her, uh, to be her niece, Elizabeth's okay. niece. So the CPD and CPD and the feds investigated that case for a number of years, uh, and then the case they determined the case went cold, and it goes to cold case files. Correct. There was there was a pretty extensive search for her remains. Uh, well, at some point, it, it was more of an uh, they were searching for the, a live body. They you know nobody knew if she ran off. Right. And maybe she ran off. Maybe she just wanted to disappear. But after uh, several years, it's, uh, I think everybody came to a conclusion she was more than likely deceased. Deceased. And nobody can locate her. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as a search, I'm not really 100% certain how intensive the search was. But I know that there was going out on foot looking right. uh, Searching abandoned buildings, alleys, garbage cans, uh, vacant lots. Uh, uh, the grandmother, or I mean Elizabeth's mother, was putting up flyers. And uh, every time she put a flyer up, she told me this. Every time she put a flyer up, somebody come down and rip them down. Said she's gone. You're never going to find her. Right. So, uh, so at this point, you take over the case, uh, and you start from square one. What happened that night? She leaves the bar with three gentlemen. Something happens. Uh, what? I, I'm sure that you re-interviewed those guys. What did they have to say about the incident? Well, that's that. That's where the case really became complicated. Uh, and the reason it, it became complicated was that the FBI was trying to bring them in to, to have an interview with them, formal interview, and the day that they were schedule for the interview uh, they showed up with lawyers so they had representation and then that kind of killed the investigation right there right without having any more as you know Mike you need better evidence you need to have uh, a, uh, eyewitness testimony physical test uh, physical evidence 
you need a lot more if you're going to bring them in and try to re-interview them, right. knowing that they've already been represented by an attorney. Right. So that's that's where the case really hit the brick wall. Right. Because we did go out and try to interview people, but we weren't able to generate any credible uh, uh, information to try to push the case forward where we right. could go out and actually re-interview or make an arrest with the, the three guys that she was last seen with. Right. So. Uh, yeah, I mean, once they've, you know, basically lawyered up, you know, you don't, you don't want to go back unless you've got something that's changed, really. I mean, even if they hadn't, you're getting diminishing returns going back and talking with nothing changing, you know, right? Because there's you're nothing get... to go at them again right. with, you know. Uh, really, that's just a matter of course, and mm -hmm. all these, especially these old investigations. You know, you can have a suspect. Even in this case, is particularly difficult because you don't have a body. Now, that sounds a little cold, but. I think it's the family, everybody, it, the family was probably, it sounds like it was on the forefront of saying, we don't believe she's alive. Correct. Right? Because Correct. she it just wasn't like her to not contact them. That's kind of right before cell phones, right? So yeah, she wouldn't, that, yeah. wouldn't have had a cell phone on her um, anyway, but she stayed in contact. She didn't, she wouldn't go days without talking to her mother or sisters, right? right and right. She had friends. kids too. She yeah, had a couple of kids, oh, so she mom wouldn't. Too, man. She wouldn't just abandon, based upon what I knew of her. Right. She would just wouldn't abandon her kids, so. Uh, yeah, it's a, it was a tough one because we hit that brick wall. Yeah, that had to be unbelievably frustrating. And you got three guys that are all like, "Yeah, we saw her. We were with her. We dropped her off, and we drove away." I mean, I was able to generate new information on where they were at. You know, I actually laid eyes on couple of them you know they didn't know I laid my eyes on them right. but they knew but I knew okay they're still around you know if I need to find them I think I know where to find them right if I was able to push the case to that point where they need to be brought in and be interviewed yeah uh, but unfortunately so me and Mike were me and Mike were talking a little bit earlier just to try and get some background on the case and one of the things that Mike brought up. I mean, there's an offside chance, right, that they do drop her off, and she's in a, a rough neighborhood, and someone sees the opportunity, and it's a crime of opportunity, right? Yeah. They they see a they see a potential victim, and they victimize her. Uh, what does your gut tell you on this? Is that is that like an outside chance? You think that the three? I it's mean, an outside chance. Yeah, I agree. Um, one of the guys that was in the car. Uh, he he. he he was uh, cooperating with the FBI, and then all of a sudden he stopped. And when I was reviewing the, the case and the reports, talking with the agent, and you know, your gut feeling after doing it for so long and handling so many cases, you know that all right, this is the guy that needs to be pushed a little bit. He knows more. He wants to tell you, but he's afraid to tell you right now. Right, and so. And, right. and someone gave him the motivation to stop talking. Correct. Yeah. Correct. And it could it have been a crime of opportunity by some, where she was dropped off in a rough neighborhood and somebody saw her? Possibly. I don't believe it. I believe right. it was the, the guys in the car. Right. Uh, yeah. I mean, this is, so, you and I have talked about this on other cases, right? Uh, you... You can't close any doors until you know that they can be closed, right? right? Just like, you know, we're always thinking, okay, what what's the outside to this? What's a defense attorney going to make hay if we get this in court with, right? So you have to, sometimes it's elimination of closing those other doors, even though you may think common sense is this guy, this guy definitely did it, or these people definitely did it, or whoever. And this suspect is very likely my, my killer. You, you have to close all those other doors, right? right. You can't leave doors open until, um, and focus, get too focused, because even if it turns out you're right and all those things are true, you've left that door, that back door open for, um, to be wrong. One, you don't ever want to be wrong when you're dealing with these stakes, and two, for, for you know, uh, trial purposes, you've left a door open right. that you can't account for, right? So, But, but it's like you said, though, Chris, could have been a crime of opportunity, but there's no evidence of that. Right. There's nobody out there that said, 
this is a crime of opportunity, so to speak. Right. Were, were you able to find any anybody that had seen her after those three guys saw her? Like someone no, in the, no, someone no. in the neighborhood that said, "Yeah, we saw her walking down the street." It, I never was able to canvas that. I'm, I'm a Chicago homicide right. guy. You know, I can't go to Indiana right, and start right. knocking on doors and asking questions. Right, right. You know, even though uh, I was able to get permission to go over there and look for him and I, find him. I'm assuming that the FBI did. Yes, they did. And they were unable to come up with Correct. anything that nobody said, yeah, we saw her at a pay phone and that was the last person that saw right. her. Right. That, so yeah. literally the last people to ever see her alive were these three guys. Yeah, and just to illustrate what the FBI did, I don't think you're probably going to know a lot about this. I just saw it, one of the things I read. The FBI got in 94, July of 94, they got, um, I guess they the, whoever the FBI guy, whoever was the lead agent or was at a supervisor level, realized they had a, tra a canine cadaver canine training thing going on in Milwaukee. So he just saw the opportunity and he, he got five of those cadaver dogs down with agents or maybe they were task force officers from somewhere else in the country. And they searched an area down there in East Chicago. He just called it a wooded area. It didn't even describe really where it was, right. but it was negative. They couldn't, they couldn't find there. I don't know what took them to that particular location yeah. or if they were just, yeah, maybe they're just thinking, well, you know, this yeah. is close. We'll give the dogs a workout. You know, I don't know that. Uh, yeah, I know they, they they went door to door. They were not uh, the agents. They were canvassing, yeah. as we know, you canvass, go around, knock on doors, businesses. Right. You see somebody working on a car. Hey, what did you hear? What do you know about this case? There, by chance. Right. Uh, and like Mike said, they did a cadaver dog search, uh, but unfortunately, you know, everything hit a dead end. Right. And that's why. I say everything points to the three guys in the car. Right. There, there's no other credible information that would say other was somebody walking down the street grabbed right. her and did something to her. Or, right. You know, so they at least need to tell a more complete story than what they exactly told. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So yeah. we dropped her off. Well, yeah, they got a little bit more detail. They said there was a confrontation. They admitted there was a confrontation, but they all they basically said she was you know, uh, mobile when she left the car. She right. was walking on her own. In fact, one of them at one point claimed he got out with her, but she had gotten away from him and he couldn't find her again. Yeah, that's what he claims, though. Yeah, right. That's right. what he claims. It's a, it's but, a pretty convenient but story, when, right? Sure. When he was re-interviewed, then his, tr his story changed. Then he called the family and his story changed again. And then family reached out to the guy and he changed his story again so he changed his story a couple times and, so and, you have, and we know Mike when you start changing you're trying to fit you're trying to make your story fit what the the uh, the investigation he's trying to make it fit but it wasn't fitting then to this day it still doesn't fit doesn't fit yeah, so he a, actually a, one of those three guys is the guy that calls the family mm -hmm. and says we were with her and we dropped her off. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like I, initially hearing that, I can't tell if that's someone trying to make themselves feel better or just vicious. Yeah, I think it's unlikely. Or somebody it's fishing. The, yeah. Right. See what see what the family knows. What the police know. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Right. That's that's what he was doing. Right. What do the police know? Right. And and. And it's like what you, Mike said, or it's cruel, or you call and you're giving little tidbits and you're teasing that that poor mother, you know, and the sister and the granddaughter. I mean, right. uh, the niece, I can, uh, you know, to do that to the family, that's a coward. Yeah. To me, uh, you know, as you can tell, I'm still passionate about this <laughs> yeah, case. Right. Well, I remember it like it was yesterday. Can I ask you? Like I can see it. Uh, why is this case so important to you? Yeah, I think it's the relationship with, with the family. And when I was digging into, you know, reading the reports and, and digging in, and, and I'm like, all right, these three guys are lying. I know they're lying. I just can't, I can't break their lie right now. Right. So uh, uh, 
Elizabeth's mother. Her name was uh, Irene, you know, and uh, nice lady. She was, a, you know, did her best to raise her family. Uh, I got to know her over a couple of months, and, and one of the things that I try to do, I always try to be as positive and upfront, honest with victims' families. Right. I, I would tell them, this is what I know, this is what I don't know. This is the missing link in this investigation. And that's what I tried to get across to Irene and uh, Elizabeth's niece, uh, who was uh, Irene's granddaughter, who I I'm still have contact with after all these years. All these years. And, and uh, you know, I think it would be like anybody else if it was your female relative. Yeah. You know, yeah. Same, with, same with Mike, same with me. Yeah. I, would want, I want answers. I want to try to find for some reason, this case just resonates with me. You know, it it's, stays with me all these years. And I made her a promise that I wouldn't forget. And that's related to the phone call that I received to come see her. You got a phone call from the niece, right? Right. To, to come see Irene. To come see Irene. Wow. And that was, as I understand it, towards the, the later days of her life, huh? Yeah, I didn't, I didn't know Irene was ill. And... Uh, you know, it's, uh, you work it, you work it for months at a time. Probably, I probably worked that case for almost two years. You know, on and off, trying to come to some kind of conclusion. I couldn't, I couldn't do it. And then all out of the clear blue, the niece calls me and says, "My grandmother wants you to come see her." And I'm like, "Okay, when can I come? As soon as possible." I'm like, "Okay," and I'm thinking that maybe she got another phone call, right. or she had new information. I gather up my file, I'm, I'm on my way there. I had no clue that she was ill. And when, when I get there, I see other family members in the house and they invite me in and I see Irene in a hospice bed in, the, in her living room of her home. And I was stunned, I didn't know what to say. And, and when she saw me, she actually started crying. It was tough. Yeah. It was tough. Still is. Yeah. And uh, that's the thing, man, right? That's what we're trying to get across. I've tried to get across from the start of this podcast. Yeah. You build these relationships with these families. It's really hard not to, you know, because you see the passion that they have to get answers and it motivates you to try and do things, you know. And that's why I have this strong pushback when, you know, you occasionally get. I see things on television or news or just in general people say yeah we just want somebody locked up we don't care what it is we want to clear the case it, it's not like that it's never right. like that because right. you you you've built these relationships with the families and you feel responsible for them. it's not just to get somebody arrested yeah. you, you want the right person and you don't ever want it to come back and, and have not told them the truth because you're always trying to, to be honest with them up front sometimes it, it, you have to be a little a little clinical you know what I mean because you have to say these are um, these are the facts as I know them this is what I'm trying to do this is what I really can't do or, or there's you know they'll come up with questions because they'll hear things right. and you have to say yeah that's probably not true we'll look into it but here based on this this and this what we do know probably right. not true right so you build those relationships like that and then you get something like that comes up it's tough right it's right. tough yeah. I can't it even was imagine. tough yeah. How, what did she what did she say to you well, if you, if you can believe it, uh, when I came in, she, she asked me to hold her hand. I was holding onto her hand, and she was telling me that she wanted to thank me for being honest with her. And, and she told me that, and I don't mean this in, to criticize anybody or critique anybody, but she told me I was the first one that was that honest with her about what was happening in the investigation and where the roadblock were and she's thinking me but I told her I didn't do anything for you yet I haven't found her she's and she's you know crying and she's no I'm at peace knowing that you're going to try and find her and you know that's powerful and, and it, it was it was sad you know and she's crying uh, Denise is crying you know I'm getting choked up you know because it was tough yeah it was really tough to see that but I made, you know, I made her a promise. I said I'll never stop trying, and 
every once in a while I'll make a call to somebody. Hey, can you take a look at this case again? Take a look, see if there's something out there. There might be something out there, but unfortunately, you know, being retired all these years, we don't know, you know, what other information might right. be out there yet. Which is why we're here now, right? That's I mean, why that's here. why we're doing this show, really, because we, I, I, you know, I think we can find her. You know, I think we will find her at some point. And, uh, you know, whether these guys go to prison for the rest of their life if they're involved or whoever the killer is, um, it'd be a lot dependent on between now and then how cooperative they are. And, you know, I'm not going out to, to interview, talk to any of these people because that's on them. If they're involved, they got to come forward and talk about that because I'm not making life easier for them. Right. You know, um, I think we can find her. I, I, She's been missing now for, what, 32, almost 32 years. Correct. Just over 32 years. July 26, 1992, so 32 years and some days, which is, if she she had children, her children are now in their 30s or 40s and grew up without a mom, and she's still missing. Still missing. Yeah. Yeah. It is a little easier, I want to say real quickly, I think as a cold case detective, when you pick up cases years later, it's a little easier to be really square with the family if they're still involved then when you if you catch the case originally because I've talked a lot about on this show about the integrity of investigation and the and the um, keeping control of information and when you are act, involved in a uh, active new homicide investigation that's really um, acute because you're you don't know what you don't know and it's you're really going on thinking something could change at any moment so you're not putting a lot of information to the family or anybody else out there. I not only say that because, as Bobby said, we don't ever want to, you know, the guys from Area 2 who were looking at it originally, I mean, it's not, we're not saying that they didn't do the things they shouldn't have done or they didn't communicate with the family the way they should. It's just that you, you, you can't really early on investigation. As a cold case guy looking at it, you know, 20 years later, there's nothing to be lost to be able to, to be more open right with the you know in the investigation even talking on a podcast like this uh, when i talked it, about becky breedlove right I, i'm giving a lot of information out there i certainly would have done in 1974 if that's my case you know what i mean um, interesting okay. interesting to hear that from your perspective having done both active and cold cases the family unfortunately right is never going to understand the difference between the two all they're hearing is the flow of information, right? Which is, that's just got to be a tough situation. It's like, uh, you know, the niece told me, uh, they, they just want to find her. Right. The goal is to find her, you know, and being able to have closure if they can find her. I think that would be a huge relief for the family. Uh-oh. And then the next step was be, of course, to try to find who the killer is. Then the next step after that is to try to arrest them and get them charged and get them convicted. But that's way down the road. You know, the goal is to find her. That's the thing. We we want to find her. I know I do. I mean, that's that that that'd be a huge relief for me. Yeah. After all these years, Cause, you know, I'll be honest. It still bothers me that I haven't. I wasn't able to find her. You know, after I made a promise, I'm going to find her. I told her I'm going to find her. Right. So when I find her, I'm going to let you know, and I didn't do it. <laughs> And then she's thanking me, right? And I didn't find her. So, right. yeah. And, and it's tough I mean, stuff to th- live with. Right? There's a lot of guys like this, though. Yeah, you know, yeah. a lot of guys that we work with. You know, we're not just TV guys. You know, <laughs> we're not TV guys. Yeah. I mean, you know, we put our heart and soul into a right. lot of these investigations. Right. You know, and, and uh, you know, it, it it stays with you. You know. It does. And then what ha- what happens is and we're. I know we've talked about this, Bobby and I. What happens to you is you get you get in this mindset and you get used to this, and you, we all have our cases. Most of us have these cases. Like, yeah, man, I'm not. I, w- I always want to know what the answers are to this. And um, then something happens. Uh, Bob calls me and says, "Hey, I got this case," and then I start looking at it, talking to him, reading what stuff I can on it, and then it gets under your skin and you're stuck. Yeah. You're stuck. I mean, I, I mean, one, because he's my close friend, and, and I, I, I know where he's at. I've been there. You've, you've been there with me, right? I mean, um, 
we want to get answers. I want to get answers for him. I want to get answers for family and for her. For her, right? right. Sometimes, in some of these cases, it's only the victim. You know, I mean. So when I picked this case up with the FBI agent, uh, I don't know how it happened, but I, we made contact with one of the local newspapers and uh, from Northwest Indiana, Northwest Indiana Times. One of the reporters agreed to uh, help me publicize the case in his newspaper. And uh, we met, we drove around, I took him to the various sites, you know, where she was last seen, where she lived, meeting Elizabeth, uh, went out to the harbor, this is where she's last seen, right on this corner, and, you know, he did an article on it, and did a little uh, video on that. Let me ask you a question. I think they're coming for you, I think. It's, did it's you get that own. warrant taken care of? I, I did not. <laughs> and just so you know, it's pistols and gun smoke. <laughs> just so you guys know. It, it, it just occurred to me, though, you know, is it possible that these guys are actually shrewd enough or someone coached them to say that they dropped her off in Indiana knowing that it would no longer be CPD jurisdiction and that they had actually, never actually left the state, never left east side, and that she was that there was a, a crime that was perpetrated in Chicago, and they tell the story that they dropped her off there because, well, at that point, man, nobody knows, and Indiana police aren't going to get involved, and they've got a better angle at walking away from this. It's a little too detailed. Yeah, yeah. No, they, they went to Indiana with her. All right. Because there's actually, I believe the FBI actually, uh, and uh, East Chicago police, and I believe some of the task force, CPD task force officers, they, I believe they actually located a couple of circumstantial witnesses. Okay. That right. saw a couple of the guys that were in the car that night uh, in Indiana. And the one guy who we believe was making the telephone calls, he, act, he actually gets stopped. Hey, what are you doing out here at 4 o'clock in the morning? Gotcha. 5 o'clock in the morning. Oh, I'm walking home. Oh, okay, go ahead. I, I had to ask. Yeah. yeah. No, no, it's a good no, question. No, it's a valid It's a valid. Uh, thought. Uh, I mean, yeah. It's just the detail and the preponderance of what we do know right. makes it pretty likely that right. you know, they were there. Did they drop her off at that spot? Uh, that could be a little iffy, but even in that, they've been pretty consistent. They've told that same yeah. story multiple times, so I think yeah. it's pretty likely that's somewhere in that neighborhood. You right. know? Um, but, but so the newspaper reporter, he put it out there video, put it out there, and uh, we're hoping to generate new leads with that by publicizing in the media. But There's still a pretty significant reward, right, from the FBI? Yes, um, yeah, I believe it's still For bad. information on that, so uh, um, somebody can do pretty well by themselves if, you know, they get a hold of us and, uh, right. yeah, it's a, and have information. It's a pretty good reward. And it's for her mi missing thing. So the recovery of her remains um, mm -hmm. is what they're looking for in that uh, information that leads to it. Um, so significant to know anybody it is interested, you know. Uh, anybody who hears this and has information, you know, um, you can just go to the FBI.gov and they have the missing thing still there. But uh, you can also reach out to me directly at just my email, which is mike at detectivestory.net, um, and I'll take care of it, you know. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. So those three guys would be in their 50s, right around there now, 50s? <sighs> could be, yeah. yeah could Close be. to it. Yeah. 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 Last, I, last I, I, I knew, that they're still around. Yeah. And uh, they, they wouldn't be hard to find. If needed, but again, we you know, the goal is to find her. I, you know, yeah, right. You know, that's the goal. So what we're going to do this is uh, step one. Right. To do this uh, episode about her, and then we're going to do follow up episodes. We're going to go out there and you know talk some people, do some uh, filming out that way, and uh, continue to follow up and see what we can get done. You know, um, I'm always going to let Bobby kind of lead where he thinks that should go but 
Uh, this won't be the last time. Appreciate the uh, the chance to bring Elizabeth's story, you know, out on social media, and, and to try to generate new information, try to find her. And that's well, we first of all we appreciate coming on. I really appreciate yeah, it. It's always honored to have you. And it's uh, it's always fun sitting down yeah. talking to you. It would be, so it'd be great to just do one where you and I are just talking about things, but never going to happen. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's never going to happen in that way. Yeah, but uh, this this case is a, a great one that needs resolution. I, I did talk to uh, Elizabeth's niece and, and Bobby hooked me up with her and uh, you know they're motivated. They st still are and it's an impressive thing to see that they're not going to let it go. I mean you think they're, that you know Bobby wants an answer, I want an answer you want an answer, family they're not going to, they're going to pass this on Yeah, infinitum, you know what I mean it's, as long as that family exists they're going answer so uh, we want to do whatever we can for them you know I hope the listeners will feel that and do the same I, there's somebody out there that knows somebody out there knows yeah yeah the, the, those three guys in the car they, they you know one of them one of them's the guy yeah. in my opinion but the yeah. other two sure. you don't they care. need to do the right thing yeah they need gonna, to do the right thing you're going to carry this with you Right. Into the afterlife, it's a big burden. That's yeah, a heavy sure burden. Is. It sure is. Um, so, yeah. you know, uh, yeah. it is what it is. I think there we know which one we're talking about. <laughs> well, but, yeah. But it's the other two that are, that are going to have to do the right thing. You know, contact contact Mike and or the FBI and say, okay, this is where you can find her. Yeah. You know, and a lot of a lot of goes from there. It goes. It, you know, time to lay that burden down and. And, uh, do right by the family, you know what I mean. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, that's where we're at. Thank you very much. Yeah, man. Thank Bobby, you. Thank you. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Yeah, I appreciate Robert, it. Yeah. And we'll uh, we'll keep after it. Uh, that's all we got today, I think, man. Yeah. Thank you guys very much. Thank you for joining us. Appreciate it again. Um, it's not the last you'll hear from Bobby Rodriguez, Elizabeth Veloz, um, but please. Get in touch with us. Get in, get involved. Get engaged, and uh, um, we'll find out what happens. So thank you again. We appreciate it. Uh, thanks to Carlos Jay for having us here at the studio. It's pretty cool, and uh, we'll take it on. Thank you. It? Thank All you. right. Thanks. Thank you. All right, Carlos. Thanks, bro. So the art wrap on episode fourteen. The uh, kind of the opening on our look into the Elizabeth Veloz case, a case obviously that uh, has stuck with Bobby Rodriguez, case that he is passionate about, wants answers to, and we want to help him get there. It's probably really evident during that interview with him. He's a really dedicated guy who was just an amazing homicide detective, good friend. Always appreciate the time with him. I appreciate him jumping in on this show and and talking about this case also uh you know thank you to chris my brother really it's always uh, great to have him he's a really good conduit for these conversations um i appreciate you joining in as always taking interest in these things uh, they mean a lot to us i hope they're is interesting for you to listen to this is the first of what will probably be many with elizabeth because we want to find out what happened with her and and try and locate her if we can um, we'll keep you up to date on that. We've got quite a bit more uh, in store, and uh, we'll keep you up to date for that whole process. Again, thank you also to Carlos and Jay for letting this record in their studio. That's a cool space that we'll be uh, recording out of a lot. Um, so just makes the entire production easier and higher quality that I hope you enjoy as well. So thank you very much. Um, keep listening like and subscribe download the episodes you can follow us on all the socials um, and our new website of course uh, detective story dot net is a great way to keep up with what's going on interact with us there you can also always reach out my email mike at detective story dot net i really enjoy the interaction so again appreciate your time and uh, stay tuned we'll have more coming
All right. Take care of yourself. Take care of each other.